This is level one of the CFA program, the topic on ethics and professional standards, and the very short reading on code of ethics and standards of professional conduct. I say this is a very short reading because it's taken verbatim out of the handbook. And my advice to you is to go ahead and get the handbook, just like I did when I went through the program hundreds of years ago, you know, it was a handbook and I carried it around with me. Now you guys have your phone, so you can, you can have it on your phone. And whenever I had a moment of peace, I would get it out and I would read it. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, offer that recommendation to you. It's a much better recommendation than to say, hey, uh, it's a great idea for you to memorize the code and memorize the standards. I, I don't think that's very good advice. But if you read this regularly, it will somehow become embedded in your brain and the memorization process will be, will be a little bit easier. Now, if we look at the LOSs, clearly that second one is, uh, is the focus of the series of readings here identify the six components of the code and the seven standards. Now, of course, when we get to the seven standards, we're going to have to do much more than identify. We're going to have to interpret and apply and demonstrate and do all sorts of different action words. But in this, in this reading, all we need to do is identify them. But we'll start out, start off talking about the structure of the CFA Institute and in particular, uh, its professional conduct program and then the process for enforcement. And then we'll go ahead and end with some ethical responsibilities. Boy, it's a good place to start with this standards of practiced handbook that I was telling you about just a few minutes ago. Go ahead and skip down to that, uh, that second orange arrow point. It explains hypothetical but factual applications of the code and the standards. And I found these to be super, super helpful. You know, they're, they're relatively short paragraphs, so these could be question stems. And the, uh, the issue will be resolved by answering the following question. You know, the Institute will say something like, okay, did this uh, analyst violate this particular standard or this particular section of the code? And so the answers are no, there was no violation or yes, because of this or yes, because of that. And that's probably the way the Institute will go ahead and uh, ask these questions on the exam. In fact, that's the way it does at the end of this reading. I believe there are 14 multiple choice questions uh, at the end of the reading, and they're very similar to what I just described. All right, so let's skip back up to the top. What are these important elements? guidance in interpreting and implementing the code. I mean, it's one thing to say something like, okay, um, you're not allowed to cross the street over there so that you can put a sign up advertising your analyst skill set. All right, so how are we going to interpret that rule? How are we going to implement that? And how are we going to enforce it? So we have a rule, so we, we need guidance. And that's what you'll see throughout, you know, probably a little bit in this slide deck, but clearly in the next seven slide decks, when we talk about the standards, we'll provide guidance. Um, you know, the interesting thing about guidance is that, you know, guidance just means, okay, use this to guide yourself into making the appropriate decision. It's not a hard and fast rule that says something like, if one is over here and one is over here and you add those two, you get two, one plus one equals two. It's not mathematical, it's part art and part science, which I've said to you guys before. Notice the second one there. This is, uh, the handbook is really part of the education process. And as I was reading through this years and years ago, it finally dawned on me, you know, being an academic, being a professor, it dawned on me that, you know what, this is a, this is a way of life. And the way of life of thinking about ethics and professional responsibilities has to be part of the core, part of the fabric, part of the DNA of, of the analyst. All right, so what else do we have down there? Uh, names contained in the examples are fictional, of course. Examples are not intended to be all inclusive, right? They may have legal implications. And then they're encouraged to discuss um, with their supervisors and the compliance department, all sorts of details about the content of the code and, and the members' obligations. 
does not attempt to address every circumstance. Now, here's my advice here. Now, this is not anything other than my advice as a longtime test creator. You know, the Institute does not sit down. At least I don't think they sit down and say, how can I trick the candidates with this particular question? Um, so when you read through the question stem, you're going to form an answer in your head that says something like, all right, I'm going down this path. And then you read the three choices and you ought to be able to link the path that your brain makes when you're reading the stem versus your answer choices. My point is here, what was that bolded say? Address every circumstance. So don't read too much. Uh, don't read too much into the uh, in into the question stem. What's that old uh, What's that old uh, saying? You know, uh, if it quacks and if it and if it waddles, it's probably a duck. You know. So uh, uh, look at the second arrow point in there. Evolving process with continuous refinement. And this is one thing that I have learned over the years is that the CFA Institute is very proud of its work as well it should be, but it recognizes that our economy and the investment industry is a dynamic process. And so it needs to evolve with the changes that underline um, the economy. Changes have been minimal over the years. So 1992 added a performance presentation standard. And in 2005, and this is about the time when I, uh, when I was taking level three, I think. And uh, you know there were some major changes, new standards, revision, and the reorganization. But the latest comprehensive review of the code and standard, which was the 11th edition, this is applicable to this day. So let's take a look at some of some of the subtleties and the changes from the old time code and let's call this the new time or the relevant code. And this is one point that I want to make to you. If you go look at one of those 14 questions at the end of this reading, you will see a question that looks just like this and it says something about, I forget what the question was, but um, there was one answer choice that said period there was not one answer choice that said comma for the ultimate benefit of society. So notice we have this bolded there in orange below. So I bet that sounds like an awfully good uh, exam question. So the ultimate benefit of society. And so essentially what's happening here is that what we would like to do is we would like to be ethical ourselves, surround ourselves with ethical colleagues so that when we're visiting with our clients, we lift up our clients and as our clients get lifted up, but you know, financially, of course, but probably uh, mentally and maybe even physically, you know, all that stuff follows, you know, the, uh, the ultimate benefit of society. I always tell my students the story uh, of uh, one of the great decisions, the greatest decision I've ever made in my life 30 some years ago when I said, y you know what, to my wife, we, uh, maybe we should get married uh, because my wife, uh, she's smarter than I am and she's more understanding than I am. But what she has done is she has helped me springboard up to uh, a, a better level. And so it's important to think about ultimate benefit of society, whatever that means. And the Institute is probably not going to get too terribly specific on a question like that. All right, the old, the old uh, code of ethics principle, promote the integrity of and uphold the rules governing capital markets. All right, that sounds like a good one, right? But let's go ahead and refine it. And so integrity, we want to keep that in, uphold the rules governing. So that sounds that sounds a little bit too specific, uphold the rules. So let's change that to the viability of the global capital markets, which, which then includes upholding the rules. So you see how, you see how the Institute is thinking. This new uh, principle is more expansive and more inclusive. And then, of course, it includes the ultimate benefit of society. All right, how about uh, uh, old versus new with the responsibility of supervisors here? And so notice the bolded in, in the bottom there to ensure that anyone subject to their supervision or authority complies with all of the stuff, which, which is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more general and a little bit more universal than that first 
old, that old one that, that reads, must make reasonable efforts to detect and prevent. So ensure that anyone's subject. So I like the new one here. Uh, additional requirement for communication, uh, significant limitations and risks associated with the investment process. I, I love this one here because remember now in level one, we've spent some time on the policy statement. We'll do that again in level two, but in level three, we'll just talk about the policy statement in almost every recording. And it's our responsibility as good financial analysts to educate the clients, right? And part of that is disclosing. And so, boy, I, I'm in favor, and I teach my students this all the time, to disclose any kind of a limitation. In fact, when I'm in class, I don't, I probably don't even use the word significant, but limitations and risks. You know, I tell my students all the time, you've heard this in a previous recording, we need to identify the risks, we need to quantify the risks, and we need to manage the risks. And part of that responsibility is to make certain that the client is aware of, uh, of all of those risks. You know, and it's one thing to say something like, oh, oh by the way, uh, nothing is guaranteed. Um, but that's why, that's why the Institute requires us to have a great understanding of things like standard deviation and value at risk and all these other different kinds of things that we've talked about in level one so that so that we can educate our clients and we don't have to talk about value at risk and we don't have to talk about standard deviation to our client but we can use more general terms that they can understand and so what the institute is trying to do here is say okay it's important to educate but it's also and maybe even equally important to make sure you disclose this all right, how about a modification of um, this particular standard here? So what are we trying to do here? May not, must not engage in any conduct that compromises the reputation or the integrity of the Institute or the validity or security of the CFA exam. So that's the way it used to read. But now look at how it reads here. What we're doing is we're going to and must not engage in any conduct that compromises reputation or integrity. All right, how about some general guidelines and um, example revision here? So of course, of course, what's happened in recent history, we have this thing called social media. So this is going to be super important, uh, probably show up in different kinds of exam questions throughout all of the different readings. And then, of course, we need to worry about our quantitative models. So let's go ahead and talk about these, uh, the CFA Institute Board of Governors. Now, I would go ahead and refer you to uh, the CFA Institute webpage and one of their readings on the responsibilities of the Board of Governors, but I've already done that, so I won't ask you to do this. But I want to share this with you just kind of quickly here. The Board of Governors has five bullet point responsibilities. And these things include uh, such things as like, you know, talent management, uh, risk management, uh, pursuing integrity, and all, all these different kinds of uh, responsibilities. But it struck me, it struck me as I was reading through these, that these are super similar to what the CFA Institute requires us to do and how it requires us to behave when dealing with clients. And so my thought was, and I wanted to share this with you, that, that the CFA Institute is not going to ask us to do anything that it is not willing to do itself. And so this just, uh, uh, it, it smacks of uh, professionalism and all sorts of great things that gives the investing community the confidence that the CFA Institute, when they put their, its stamp of approval uh, on our skill set, it, it has some meaning. Now, the Board of Governors also has oversight of the Professional Conduct Program and the Disciplinary Review Committee. Now, I'm also going to suggest here that you spend just a few minutes, type in, a, do a quick search, CFA and Disciplinary Review Committee, and you'll bring up the page in, in which the CFA Institute 
publicizes its results of the disciplinary reviews. And I was a little uncomfortable reading these because the names and the firms are, are involved, but you'll see violations throughout the entire program. There'll be violations for super turnover of accounts. There'll be violation of biased recommendations. There'll be, there'll be violations of uh, treating clients inappropriately and not within uh, the standards that are outlined here uh, in the code and, uh, and otherwise. Now, I don't want you to go read those just, you know, kind of uh, for your own benefit and for the exam, but for the general idea and getting the sense of what the Institute is trying to get us to think like. And as you read through these, at the very end, you'll read what the ultimate decision was from the DRC. And those decisions will be something like, you know, the uh, one year suspension, something like that. Yeah, the professional conduct staff is going to establish and review professional conduct policies that relate not only, <clears throat> excuse me, to the CFA Institute, but also for CIPM uh, and, and possibly others uh, in the future. Now, how does the Institute become aware of these violations or alleged violations or potential violations? And, you know, I love a handful of these, but the first one here just really kind of struck me right over the top of the head in terms of realizing that, you know, the Institute is asking us to, and we'll see these when we when we look at the uh, codes here in just a few minutes, to behave with integrity, to treat everybody uh, in the proper manner, to do thorough research. I think they call that due diligence and, and a whole bunch of things. And we'll, we'll read all those here in just a few minutes. but. Part of that means that we have to review our own behavior. And if we find some kind of a violation, it's probably up to us to go ahead and disclose this uh, to the Institute itself. So I would imagine that lots of these are self disclosures, but um, there can be written complaints so that, you know, supervisors or clients or colleagues or uh, maybe a journalist, you know, practically anybody could go ahead and write to the Institute and say, you know what, I think Jim did this and this. Uh, I'm not sure if this is consistent with your rules and regulations. And so, of course, um, uh, the professional conduct will go ahead and put together some kind of a review. Uh, evidence of misconduct through public sources such as media article. Let me just tell you a quick story here. From previous recordings, you probably know I'm a big sports fan, so I watch a lot of football and golf and basketball on TV. Not a whole lot of baseball, but every once in a while, you'll see a fan out in the uh, <clears throat> in the stands behaving inappropriately. And I often wonder when I'm watching this and I'm thinking, you know, I wonder who that individual is. Is it possible that this individual holds the CFA designation. And if so, is that behavior a violation of some kind of professional standard? Uh, you know, throwing a big can of beer on the left fielder as he's trying to catch a home run ball. I, I don't really know if that's a violation, but it sure sounds to me like that's uh, unprofessional conduct. So public sources, when you hit this exam question, think about me and watching, uh, watching football. Reports submitted by proctors. All right, so what do proctors do on the exam? You know, you would think that they're there to distribute the exams to us and then collect them uh, at the end of that session. And that's probably true. But what they're doing is they are making certain that there are no violations of the standards of behavior during uh, during exam and examination day. And so here's, here's my piece of advice is that uh, at the end of each session, the proctor is going to say, okay, time is up. Please put your pencils down. And as soon as the proctor says down, there's not a comma after that that says, oh, feel free to finish the question that you're working on. Make sure you put your make sure you put your pencil down uh, right and immediately, because if you go uh, and look at some of these violations, you'll inevitably read about somebody who was writing and writing and filling in the blanks and doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, after after the proctor said time is up. So don't don't do that. 
And then of course, when you're done taking the exam, there are still some standards. And we'll talk about that, you know, in the seventh video here, there are still, still some acceptable standards of behavior. Uh, you know, it's probably not appropriate to say something like, here, let me get my phone out. I don't have my phone here. Uh, let, let me take a selfie with the answer key that I somehow uh, got a hold of three days before the exam. Here I am smiling because I know that I passed the exam. Not that you could ever get a hold of, uh, get a hold of the answers, but clearly that would be, that would be some kind of a violation. In fact, I tell my children all the time, the less you're on social media, the better off you are, <laughs> or at least the better off I am. All right, so what's the process here? All right, so of course, it's a fact-finding mission. And so, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the PC staff is just gonna say something like, here, I'm gonna pick up the phone, and oh, maybe we can do a Zoom call, right? We're all experts on Zoom now, and let's go ahead and interview uh, whoever submitted the complaint or talk to the member and say, hey, you know, tell me your story. And I imagine that the staff is pretty open-minded and, uh, and they're gonna say, oh, we appreciate your honesty and your integrity, and this is what we're gonna do. So there can be an acquittal, there can be a cautionary letter, and then there can be disciplinary measures. When I was reading through those uh, on the CFA Institute's webpage, uh, a number of them were one-year suspensions. I don't, think, I don't think in the 10 or 12 minutes or so that I read through a handful of those that I found a, uh, that I found uh, someone who's had their designation taken from them. Now, of course, at the end, the member can either accept or reject them, and then there can be some kind of a review. So public censure, suspension, I was telling you about that, prohibition from participation in the CFA program or a revocation of the charter. So that looks like, uh, that looks like a really good multiple choice question, and so it sounds to me like the question could read something like, which is the least likely sanction? And, you know, two of these would be on there and then they could make up a third one that sounds good, but, but it's probably not relevant. All right, how about adopting the code and the standards? So what is the Institute asking us to do? They're, they're asking us to read the code and the standards and to abide by all the rules and regulations that are in them. And then what we wanna do is we wanna go ahead and extend that out to, to all of the people around us. So it applies to members and candidates. And it, uh, the CFA Institute encourages the firms to adopt the code and the standard as part, as part, and that's important. It doesn't replace the code of ethics of the firm, but it can be a part of the code of ethics. And I think that's probably, uh, that's pretty common in, in my experience. So firms should fully comprehend, right, the firm whose code of ethics meets the principles of the code, they can make the following statement. And I think this is a really great exam question. Let's just skip down to the last sentence there in orange. This claim has not been verified by the CFA Institute. Um, if, I were, if I were creating a question, I would take out the word not and have this as one of the multiple choice answers. This claim has been verified by the CFA Institute. Don't, don't put that one down. Uh, because the CFA Institute is not going to send a representative throughout the world, right? If Santa Claus and the elves wanted to uh, wanted to adopt the code and the standards, there are probably not going to be too many volunteers to go up to the North Pole. All right, how about ethics and the investments in the investment industry? Notice a couple of the bolded words that we have in this slide. Um, Markets are fair and transparent. Now we hear this word transparency from our political leaders, from our corporate leaders. We hear this from all different sorts of people. Whenever I hear someone say that, that transparency is important, I always kind of, uh, kind of piques my interest. Um, but notice the first part of that sentence, e efficient capital markets are achievable. All right, so we can go back to 1970 and Eugene Fama, who developed this efficient capital markets theory. And so, of course, like all of the founding fathers of finance, Eugene Fama had a host of assumptions that supported his model. And, uh, and one of them was markets are fair and transparent. So it's up to us to contribute to that transparencies. All right, so what do we have to worry about? Laws, regulations, enforcements are important, but also an ethical foundation that 
guide the judgment and behavior of the investor. So this is what I was saying a little bit earlier about the ethics can't just come from your brain saying, okay, uh, if this happens and this happens and this happens, then I'm supposed to do this. And that would be compliant with, uh, you know, standard three, whatever that is. No, what the Institute wants us to do is it wants, to, of course, to become part of our head and our brain, but it wants it to become part of our fabric, of our soul, of our being, our core. You know, when we talk about uh, when we talk about corporate finance, you know, uh, the term is core competencies. Focus on core companies, competencies of a business, and that's that's what should be. Uh, you know, I don't know. Is that your heart? Is that uh, whatever? Look at that third arrow point: the culture of ethics for the ultimate benefit of society. Now, you guys know this just as well as I do: is that there now are. Um, chief risk officers for corporations. There are chief ethics officers for corporations. And so what what these two individuals are responsible for setting the standards for the entire firm. It's not like we can say, okay, this silo over here, I want you to focus on these kinds of ethics. And this silo over here, I want you to focus on. No, no, this has to be a culture of ethics. And so a good exam question probably won't include that word culture, but it'll say something to indicate culture. And then the answer choice should be, uh, uh, should be obvious. Yeah, here we go. I've said this a few times. Yeah, for the ultimate benefit of society. So I've already told you that you're, uh, you're going to be prepared for that. So politically, socially, and financially stable society. Efficient global capital markets that enables the efficient allocation of resources. Boy, that sounds like a dull economics kind of a, of, of a sentence or a phrase, but I love it. I tell my students this all the time. Look, here we go. We have some resources. Whatever they are, what can you do? You know, you can have gold that's in the ground. There's a resource, or you can have strong muscles so that you can go out and build a bridge. I mean, whatever whatever those resources are. What the institute wants us to do is to facilitate a scenario under which the strongest bridge builders do this over here and what did I say gold or silver whatever that was the strongest and the best and the most efficient gold miners go and do that stuff over there so that we efficiently allocate those resources where it serves society best ah so what's that arrow point production of goods and services innovation employment okay that should make a lot of sense there yeah, ethics should be universal to promote trust and integrity beyond acceptable local or regional customs. So of course, the Institute here, I mean, they're global. And if you look at the, uh, the 14 members that serve on the Board of Governors, you'll see that they are from the entire globe. And so each of these individuals has a unique set of background inputs to bring to this, well, let's call it the ultimate benefit of society. And so, of course, here uh, we have our own kind of an idea of what benefits society, but somewhere over there or somewhere over there, they have probably similar but not identical ideas about what benefits society. So we bring all these really smart men and women together and, uh, and we can figure it out. Uh, individuals and firms should consider, consider the indirect effects. Oh boy, so what are, what are we doing here? I want you to think about this. Let's suppose that I'm a conductor, even though I know nothing about music other than rock and roll, and you guys are my orchestra out there. And I've written this piece and it's a magnificent piece, you know, and so we're presenting it. And so I'm requiring and I've tested you and I've trained each one of you to play the violin in the right way, to play the piano the right way, the cello and all these kind of different instruments. And so if we work in unison, if we're perfectly working in unison, this music is going to explode and everybody, regardless of their backgrounds or their musical interests, are going to say, hey, that was really awesome. But if one of you decides to play the wrong note or the wrong chord or play out of tune or play when you're not supposed to play, then it ruins the entire musical experience for the audience. And so this might not be a perfect uh, analogy, but I think it suits well here for that first teardrop point, right? The indirect, indirect effects of the actions on the whole investment community. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna swing back to reading these violations of the code uh, 
and the standards. And when I, when I read these, and I, I'm a little bit saddened. Do you remember I said I was a little uncomfortable? I'm saddened that that somebody, that some individuals went ahead and and violated one uh, uh, one of these standards. Yeah, isolated and unrelated may be considered individually harmless, but you know the market crisis in in the aggregate. You know, there's that old saying: the one bad apple shouldn't spoil the whole bunch. And uh, I'm wondering if any of you know who sang that song, "One Bad Apple," Donny Osmond. I'm betting most of you don't even know who Donny Osmond is, and that's okay. Uh, How about this? Laws and regulations guide toward ethical behavior, but do not consider all unethical behavior. So this goes back to what I was saying about the Institute wanting to have breadth and depth, but you can't cover everything, right? You can't cover like how, how you're supposed to put your socks on in the morning when you get out of the shower, right? So we'll just say something like, you know, put something on your feet, but how we do that uh, might not, now of course this is a silly example, there's probably nothing unethical about putting your socks on, but there probably are better ways to do it. And so uh, laws and regulations cannot consider all behavior. And so that's what this entire code and standards is trying to accomplish is saying, okay, we're gonna, we have these laws and regulations, we're gonna layer it with our own ideas behind what are what are, boy, what do we have in that second teardrop point? Considered morally correct. Yeah. So ethical principles cover beyond what is considered legally sufficient, right? So the legality is kind of like maybe the minimum. So how do we apply all of this? Yeah. Laws, regulations, professional standards are not enough to guide ethical behavior. So look what we have in that arrow point. Internal thought process before making a decision. This gets back to, to the, the science up here in your brain and then the artistry here in, in your soul or in your heart. Uh, the internal thought process before making a decision. Boy, that's an important step. And I'm guessing the Institute is thinking along the lines that, hey, this is probably the most important step that we take a step backwards and say, all right, here's the scenario presented for us. Here are the decisions that are in front of us. And then let's go ahead and think of all the consequences. And so it's important to consider what this decision is going to infer from a financial decision, of course, as it relates to our supervisors or our clients or, or our colleagues, but we need to consider this from an ethical perspective. And that's why we have this in bolded down there, high standards of ethical behavior. Now, of course, we want to do this through, throughout the firm. And so what we want to do is have these professionals to materialize the aspirations. You know, think about it this way. Um, Wherever you live, you probably, even those of you who are not sports fans, you probably know people who root for the Baltimore Ravens or for the New York Yankees uh, or for, uh, you know, the Los Angeles Dodgers. And so they talk about, they talk about the game last night and they talk about this. Well, this means that what we ought to be doing is talking about ethics. Notice that second arrow point there, making compliance with the code of ethics a firm's culture. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and talk about the Dodgers, right? Let's say, yeah, Dodgers, they're going to win the World Series. Let's talk about that. But then let's go ahead and layer that conversation with a conversation on ethics. And hey, I saw somebody on TV do this. Do you think that's part of the code, etc., cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Notice what we have in bold there, that second teardrop point, the professional's desire to do right. I am of the opinion that every little person who's born is born with the capacity to make the right decisions throughout his or her life. Yeah. All right. So there's a natural human desire to, uh, to do right. Now, of course, the senior managers have to promote this ethical behavior and they have to practice this ethical decision making framework. Notice what we have down there in the bottom. Establish a muscle memory. Ha, ah, muscle memory. So up here, up here, muscle memory. 
Now, of course, the Institute is perfectly aware that the economy is dynamic. The investments community is dynamic. So it's, cha it's changing all the time. So how do we make certain, how does the Institute make certain that these standards and the code are effective? Well, the handbook gives us a little bit of a, a little bit of a guide here. Representative high standards of professional conduct relevant to the changing nature of the investment profession. All right, I talked about that. Globally applicable, you know, I said this about the Board of Governors and, and coming together as an entire global community. And this is important here, the sufficiently comprehensive, so there's the breadth and the depth. Practical, yeah, this is super important, practical. My, my wife is really, really big on this, that word practical. You know, whenever we have an issue or a situation, she always says to me something like, she said, you know what, Jim, what do you want to get out of this at the end? You know, what's your end goal? And then, so how do you get there? What's the best practical way to get there? And that helps we, me and us with our decision making. Specific and forceable, that makes sense. And then testable for the CFA program. And that's probably an important one because remember, the Institute says somewhere in uh, right after you register, it's probably not the first thing, but it might be the second or 10th thing. You know, the Institute says to you, every LOS is a potential exam question. So this means that it has to be testable. You know, the question can't be like, oh, hey, give your opinion on what was that rule I made up earlier in this slide, in this recording? You can't cross the street to do something. You know, OK, Jim's crossing the street. Is he in violation? Is that a, is that testable? I'm not sure if it is. Sometimes I give good analogies. Sometimes I don't. All right, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the code of ethics here. Notice what we've done. We've highlighted some important super words, and I mentioned these a little bit earlier. What did I say earlier? Integrity. I know I said that. Uh, diligence. I know I said ethics. Yeah. So this this makes perfect sense. But and this is these are great exam questions, right? We've got to deal in an ethical manner with. I'm going to read these to you. The public, <laughs> not just the investing public, but the non-investing public as well. Clients, prospective clients. Our colleagues, you know, both the people that with whom we work and for whom we work, colleagues in the investment profession and other participants. And what our responsibility is, is to put the integrity of the investment profession and the interest of clients. And that's an important one there above our own personal interests. Right. We need to in, use independent professional judgment. So what the Institute is trying to do is strip away any biases we have. And so when you when you read these questions on the exam, when you read the question stem, you need to have a boy. I don't want to tell you this. You need to you need to have a blank brain. So I don't I don't need to tell you to erase everything that's in your brain, but you need to have kind of a blank slate. And, and the Institute will give you a scenario and you need to say something like, OK, is this analyst making any kind of a biased decision? I love this fourth one here, practice and encourage others to practice in a professional and ethical manner. So let's go back to uh, let's go back to my uh, my example of throwing beer on the left fielder. You know, suppose that suppose that you're you're out with your buddy and he's throwing beer and you are a member and you don't throw the beer, but you hand him another beer and you say, hey, yeah, great shot. Do it again. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a violation there to me. So yes, encourage others. So that's that's a super important and a super great exam question. And the fifth one here, boy, we talked about this benefit of society and integrity and viability. And then I love this last one. This is what this is what I'm doing, and I'm hoping this is what you're doing here. Uh, improve their professional competence. Uh, I, I say this all the time to my students. I've said this to you in previous recordings is that uh, I like to refer to myself as a voracious reader. And my cousin makes fun of me all the time because I'm always not just a reader, but a voracious reader. And this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to improve my competence in other areas. But a lot of times I read investment stuff and uh, and hopefully you'll become voracious readers and you can tell everybody that you're a voracious reader. All right, how about the seven standards here? I'm not going to go through these uh, too slowly right now, probably pretty quickly, because as you can see, uh, there are seven standards. So there are seven videos here, but professionalism, integrity of capital markets, uh, 
duties to clients, but also duties to employers. And then this one here is one that I have always liked investment analysis, recommendations and actions, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a math guy. I love to do something in Excel. I love to compute the standard deviation of a four stock portfolio. And my students always say to me, uh, they say, uh, you know, you know what, Jim, we could we don't have to use our calculator today if you don't want us to. But, you know, uh, my dissertation chairman gave me some lots and lots of good advice back in the old days. He always said to me, you know, the more math, you know, the better off you are. All right, so, you know, uh, investment analysis and then recommendations and actions. So conflicts of interest, you know, these are these are great exam questions. And then the seventh one, responsibilities uh, for me as a member and for you guys as candidates. And that takes us through uh, the LOSs here. We'll go ahead and focus on those seven standards in the upcoming recordings. Um, what I'm recommending that you do right now, right now, when you turn off this video is go look at those 14 questions and answer them to the best of your ability. I bet you should, you know, based on our discussion here, I bet you should be able to get 10 or 12 of them correct. But I want you to do that before, before you look at uh, the next seven videos. So have a great day. Thanks for watching and good luck studying.